Hi friends, welcome to Raising Lifelong Learners. I'm your host, Colleen Kessler, and this is the podcast where I encourage you to trust yourself and your differently wired kiddos as you help cultivate their curiosity, encourage them to discover the world around them, embrace who they are wired to be, all while helping them discover their passions, interests, and raise them to become the amazing adults they're meant to be. Hey, 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 welcome back. This is episode 244. Today I'm talking to my friend Rachel Fig from Spark Schooling all about how to fit in those extra activities that you know are going to make a huge difference in your homeschool and really light that spark in your kids so they can follow their interests and discover new passions, interests, and things to love about learning. She gives us great practical tips for how to fit it in without going crazy. You are going to love hearing her chat all about the different things that you can do to just light some new sparks in your homeschool. Okay, so this is going to be a good one. A special shout out though first to CTC Math, our sponsor. We really appreciate them. Check them out at ctcmath.com. I'll talk about them a little bit more later on in this episode. So without further ado, pop your earbuds in, go for a walk, tackle the dishes, or just hide out and enjoy the episode. And let's get on with it. Hey there. I am so excited to be here with a friend who I've been trying to get on for a while. And like one thing leads to another, as you know, homeschooling parents who are listening, that life gets in the way often. And it feels like life has continued to get in the way between Rachel and I, but I'm excited to finally have her here, my friend Rachel Fig from Spark Schooling. Hello, Rachel. Hi, how are you? I'm great. I'm so glad that we're finally able to do this and connect and chat. Me too. And I have to admit that it's been my fault every time. So it's not Rachel. It's totally me, life getting in my way and me messaging her. Sorry, I have to cancel again. So it's totally me. I'm the slacker here. You forgive me though, right? (laughs) Of course, of course. <laughs> it's just random things that get keep getting in the way. So no worries. Yep. Totally We're here. The, totally the life of a homeschooling family, right? Absolutely. All right. So before we get started, because I think this is going to be a great conversation, can you take a minute and just introduce yourself to listeners? Let us know who you are, you know, a little bit about your family and what you do so that those who are unfamiliar with you and with Spark Schooling can get a little picture of who we're talking to today. Sure, of course. My name is Rachel Fig, and I am a homeschool mom of four kids. They are they range in ages from my oldest is thirteen all the way down to an almost six year old. So I have these four kids that we homeschool. We've been homeschooling ever since the beginning, since my youngest was little, and we live in South Carolina, and we just really enjoy all of the family things, right? We're we're big into, into family fun, my husband and I and our kids. My program, Spark Schooling, um, is a program I started a few years ago, uh, several years ago now, and it is a way to really get more curiosity-driven learning and creativity into your homeschool kids because they are already curious and so creative. And we, they're always asking, I feel like for all of these, you know, ways to become, you know, to, I don't know, just like dive into those things that they're curious about. And so this is a way through uh, learning in art and music and physical education and STEM, a way to dive into, to learning in, in those subject areas. So that's a little bit about what I do. I'm, my background is in music education. I've been a teacher my entire life, formally and informally. And, and I just love seeing those sparks, you know, fly in, in kids when they're, when they're really learning stuff that they're interested in. I love that idea of lighting the spark and and kind of keeping it going and fueling it in those areas that, you know, oftentimes we kind of forget about or struggle to fit in. I know as a homeschool parent who has all the things, you know, you're responsible Mm -hmm. for, looming over my head, I I often distill things down to like, we have to get through like the must do's and just, okay, as long as you get through some math, a little bit of reading yep. and a little bit of writing today, we are good. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and then I forget the other things 
or I swing the pendulum completely in the opposite way. And we like do all this art or all this music or all this everything and forget about everything else. And so I never feel like I, I have the ability to just be consistent because it seems big. Like those subjects that you mentioned, you know, art, music, PE and STEM, those feel like big efforts and big asks. So how do you, how, how do you help or even think about fitting those kinds of things? And I know you've got a specific program that helps that. So talk to me about both the mindset, making sure those things happen and like why that's important. And then some of the things that you have found to be helpful. And then we can talk about specifics with your program, how that's easy to fit in because of that. Yeah. So when you're trying to, or when you're thinking about homeschooling your kids, it's exactly like you said, a lot of people really focus on those core subject areas and, you know, think I'm going to get those into place first. And then if we have time, we will add all of these other, these fun things. We'll, we'll figure out that later. We'll figure out art later. We'll figure out music later. Or if your kids, you know, come to you and they're like, I want, you know, I am interested in art or, or you start to notice that they are really talented in something, then you'll go and seek out resources for for those other subject areas. But the thing is, is that when we're talking about the whole child and really learning in general, these types of subjects, these creative and curiosity driven subjects are what helps, number one, it helps your kids want to learn more. It helps them stay engaged and it helps them have be able to switch between their right and left brain. All of this stuff is is going on. So it's going to help your kids overall to have a more well-rounded sort of core and these other things in, in your homeschool at the same time. These are also such great opportunities to pull in connections uh, that you that they might not make otherwise because they're learning on a low low pressure sort of thing, you know, they're painting something that relates to something that they've studied either, you know, right now that they're learning right now like they're studying ancient Egypt and you're doing an artwork that goes with Egypt. Maybe that connects now, or maybe you learned about Egypt last year and they're like, oh yeah, you know, this is Egypt. We learned about this already. Or maybe you won't learn about Egypt until next year, but they're still going to have that connection and be able to make that connection, which makes all of the learning easier. So I know it's hard. (laughs) I know it's hard to, to try to pull it all in, especially when you are bogged down with you know, different kids and different interests and different, you know, things that you're trying to accomplish. It's it's hard to keep this all in a way that meets everybody's needs. And so what I have found that really works well is to make things really easy and really simple to keep things easy for you. You don't want to go and try, you know, to try to just recreate something like the take on this really intricate art project or, you know, make your kids all learn an instrument, even if they're not interested in learning an instrument, because you know, piano is important and you know, music is important, you know, or sign kids up for sports. We did that when they don't want to play a team sport. (laughs) We did that. One of my kids did not, but I'm like, what are you going to do for, for, you know, physical activity? And what are you going to do for that? You know, put them in sports. So that's the easiest way I feel like to get these things in is to keep it simple, keep simple materials on hand in your home and take those those little sparks of curiosity and allow your kids to follow them and find simple ways that you can incorporate that into, into your homeschool and not even homeschool, just incorporate them into your life, right? Like we don't have to make it part of, we don't have to make everything part of the traditional formal homeschool day where everyone's sitting around the table and it looks so picture perfect like it does on Instagram, right? Like (laughs) we can make these things easy for, for ourselves, have them available, even things like, like board games or, you know, those little like, uh, like science experiment kits that they might think you might not be studying chemistry, but you find this chemistry kit, let have it, have it and have it available. Let your kids dive into those curiosities whenever whenever they want, whenever they have that spark of, of curiosity about something, like let them go, let them go do that even in the afternoon or on the weekends. 
Yeah, I like I love thinking about it in that way because I think that we forget, right, uh, when we're faced with all of the shoulds as as homeschool parents, especially like right now, you know, it's it's spring, we're thinking about next fall, we're thinking about like getting everything lined up so that we can enjoy the summer and then hit the ground running in the fall. So, we're planning for all these different subjects and all these different areas, but some of the best learning comes from just following those rabbit trails or that interest or that curiosity. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the times our kids are picking up more than they even know, right? I've had recent conversations with some of my older kids, like you didn't teach us this, or you didn't teach us that, or I feel like I'm behind in this area. And then when, when we deepen the conversation and probe a little bit, they actually know more than they think that they know right. in an area because they've just been interested in some of those kits or exploring something or listening to, you know, a docudrama or something. Mm -hmm. And, and so we don't have to highlight every single thing and make it, like you said, a part of sitting down and doing school that day. I mean, I don't know about you, but especially the longer I do this homeschooling thing, the less mm -hmm. my days look like sitting around a table at all in any way, shape right. or form. It's more like, you know, hey, did you do your math today? Because that's the one thing I know you have to sit down for. Um, right. And, Sometimes uh, they're laying on the floor, though. I mean, well, this is true. <laughs> Ours is on the computer right now, so they can't okay. lay on the floor with it. But <laughs> if they pull it up in the iPad, they can. But it's you forget that you can just incorporate things. So let's talk some specifics so people can like listen to this, this episode and take away like one or two ideas in each of the, the different areas. And then we can dive a little bit deeper. Let's talk about, okay. So you mentioned physical education, right? Sports. I have the same kids you described. I mean, my mm -hmm. oldest cried on the t-ball and soccer field. Soccer was yeah. very overwhelming because everybody was yes. moving in every different direction. And then while a couple of them said that they were interested, they really weren't once we got them signed up. And then, so they they didn't do sports. And mm -hmm. there have been times I've been like, okay, I am failing them because they're not <laughs> super physically active, though they are, I've got dancers and, and other things, but what kinds of, what's a practical thing we can do to sneak in a little bit of PE when we're not in a program or in a sport or in something organized so that it does feel like one more thing, or I have to find something to sign them up for. Yeah. I always think of those things, same things that you were saying, like my kids are going to look back and be like, well, you, we didn't learn I didn't learn this. So I want my kids to at least have a basic understanding of how these things work. So taking those opportunities as as they come, as they present themselves, are the neighborhood could are the neighborhood kids going out and playing basketball? Let them go play basketball. Let them go, you know, mess around, play basketball, learn from their peers in in some of these ways. Play soccer with them in the backyard or play catch or anything that you know how to do. Just make time to go and and do those things with them. If they are interested in something more just individual, like I know some of my kids don't like team stuff at all. They want to do individual things. So do that. My my husband's a personal trainer and he likes to and he likes to work out with the kids, like teach them how to how to do those like weightlifting and do it safely and different all sorts of things like that. Like you can just find what the people around you that know how to how to do things, let them teach your kids the things that they're interested in. And then if there's just, you know, some playground games or fun activities you can learn, like juggling or which is so good for hand-eye coordination and crossing the midline and all sorts of things. Like juggling is a great, a great skill to have and it can be started very, very basic, right? So just starting with those basic things, even anything like, like running or conditioning or anything like that, just make it fun and take those opportunities that you have and go and play. I love that. And you're, you're so good at just looking around what you're already doing and making, like pointing out how that fits in. You know, most mm -hmm. people wouldn't think of juggling as, you know, PE, but then finding the different skills that it brings out a couple years ago, maybe a year and a half ago or so, you were in the learner's lab teaching a lesson on found sound. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. for those of you who are listening and are members of the lab and maybe missed that lesson, you need to go back to it because the kids loved it. 
-hmm. it was, it was one of those like masterful, but super simple ways to get kids engaged with their surroundings. And you taught music and rhythm within that context through a screen, helping them see the stuff around them. Can you talk a little bit about finding, you know, art and STEM and music in, in their everyday lives and how to incorporate that super simply. So again, parents aren't like, holy cow, now I've got to sign them up for, you know, a music lesson. I need to get them, you know, trained in this, that, or the other, maybe it's not an instrument, but I've got to find something else. And then I've got to get an art class in there. And then like, how do I do all these things? Yeah. I think the best way to do it is through low pressure learning, just low pressure opportunities, like I've been saying, where they're exploring and following those curiosities, making connections to what they're already learning. So if you are learning about, if you're learning about, okay, so here's an example. We were reading Esperanza Rising as a family read aloud, and they're talking about, which is a great novel by Pam Munoz Ryan. We were reading that, and we had some STEM challenges that went along with it. And one of them was creating a dust proof dwelling. So you, because there's a dust storm in the book. So you had to go and create something just out of simple materials that you had. So I think it was paper and, or it was paper plates or something. I mean, it was so easy. It was just things that the kids could create and then tape to try to seal the edges. And then you poured sand all over it to see if any sand got in, you know, and then one of my kids, of course, got out the leaf blower and started to (laughs) like blow a pile of sand into it. I was like, wow, I don't know if it's going to hold up to that. The entire thing fell apart. But stuff, stuff like that, where you're using simple materials and that's STEM, that's problem solving. Like you have to, we're not going to go and create like an actual, an actual house <laughs> that, you know, and then recreate a, sta- a sandstorm, but they're learning about building a prototype and they're learning about solving problems and they're learning about how to think creatively and outside the box. So they're not going to forget that, you know, and when those types of problems come up later in life, they can apply the same concepts and the same problem solving, you know, skills that they've learned through this and they can apply it in that whatever that situation is. It's probably not going to be, you know, a creating something, you know, a dwelling place where they need to keep the dust out from the dust storms, but it will be something, right? There is something that they have learned there that will apply later on. And it was meaningful because it was related to the book that we were learning and it was connected to to science and it was connected to all these other things. So I think that's the key is keeping things connected and keeping them simple using simple materials. We have for music, we have very simple music uh, instruments in our house that we use in in for my program like that they go along with the with the program at Spark Schooling, but a bucket, like a 5-gallon bucket with with drumsticks or, you know, people even use like kitchen utensils as the drumsticks. So that's we're learning rhythm. We're playing rhythms not by learning the note, but by following rhythm of the words, like blueberry, strawberry, you know, and ice mm-hmm. cream, you know, stuff like that. So that they're they're making music and I show the music, the the symbols of what goes along with those words, but it's not overwhelming. It's not complicated. They are still, but they're playing music. They are doing music. It's just very simple. Other things like just like music, music games, just games that are set to song that mm-hmm. you can play and do this fun activity as a family but you're singing and you're moving in rhythm and you're doing all of these these musical things and you're learning those musical concepts and you're being musical. You are making music. It's just not in the traditional way that we always think about like sitting down and doing piano lessons. So simple, simple instruments. A lot of times we don't even use instruments. We use our body because our body is a great instrument. We can Mm -hmm. stamp and clap and pat and sing. And all of these things are our rhythm, voice, melody all of that can can make can make music so talk to me a little bit about what spark schooling is like what the your program is so we know that the idea of spark schooling came about because of that lighting you know the spark and taking that spark and you know kind of fanning the flames of it and and following their curiosity but on a practical level what kinds of things does the program offer to parents who are like me 
busy, overwhelmed and being pulled in a lot of directions, but wants to integrate some more of the things that she feels like she's not getting in, like art and music and, and physical education and stuff. So we took, we we recognize that this is not something that you would, maybe would even think of, you know, those, the other things that I mentioned, like playing rhythm on a bucket, you know, that might not be something that you think of, but I'm the, I'm a music teacher and I love it. And so what I've done is gathered other experts and pulled together video classes, like little video classes where we teach these skills and then the kids are able to go and do the activity. So our art classes are step by step follow following Mrs. Strong, our art teacher, and following you can pause it, which is why we made everything pre-recorded was so it would you can just easily stop catch up, everyone can catch up, <laughs> and then move on. And so that was why, that was how we put it together uh, to make it super, super simple. The kids can go through it uh, at their own pace. There's different there's different ways to to join or to participate. You can just do small like units that we have that we've pulled these classes kind of go together or they all deal with spring or we have our summer camp program. You know, you can just do little units like that, or you can just dive into the entire library. We have the entire STEM library. So if you just wanted to do STEM with your kids, you could just self-pace, let your kids explore. You want to, you know, read this picture book along with us and do this fun project, go for it. You want to read this novel and do these things, go for it. And the kids can be in charge of that, or you can align it with whatever you're learning about. And then we also have the entire library, which is all of our art and all of our music, all of our STEM and all of our PE. It's all in there, super organized that you can do the same thing with. So we've tried to make it really, really easy for you to just jump in and and use it in whichever way works best, fanning that flame of interest that your kids already have or giving your kids a little bit of a spark by, you know, introducing some things that maybe they they don't know uh, that they are interested in yet. Uh, so and it's also really good for families when you're one of your kids is this is my family. <laughs> One of my kids is super artistic and another felt like he was not as artistic as his brother. Mm -hmm. And so when we sit down and we do these classes together, you know, it's not about like this class is only for my artistic kid because he's the artistic one. You know, it's the the one that's not doesn't feel he's super creative or artistic, has persevered through it and and has learned a lot of techniques and skills through this that, you know, he wouldn't have if I only signed the artistic kid up for art classes, you know? So I love doing it together as a group because it really helps the kids that are interested in that particular subject to really become more interested and develop more skills. And it feeds that, but it also pulls everyone along with them with that low pressure learning. Nobody's grading it. <laughs> Nobody's, you know, judging it or assessing it, which is, I think, what the big problem was for my one child who hates sports. You know, it's like there's that assessment. There's people watching, you know? So right. they want to just explore and learn in this low pressure environment. So we've done our best to create a place that they can do that in the, the safety of their own home where they can learn all of the things that they're interested about. Love that. So it's it's like, you know, just to put it into perspective, it's like a, a Netflix kind of like library of different things that you can choose based on what you are interested in doing like that week or if there's, you know, if you're doing a certain book like Esperanza Rising and, you know, you could find something that goes along with that. So it's just choose what you're going to do, queue it up and um, get the materials so you and your kids can get started with it. So low impact, you don't have to be in a certain place at a certain time. Um, you just right. can go in there and, and dive in at any point. I yeah. love that idea. So you said you have a couple different teachers that, that teach the different programs. So they're mm -hmm. all like subject area experts. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. We have a lot of teachers that taught in schools. We also, for our PE, we have very specific experts in those subject areas. So we have a yoga instructor that's in there and we have, and she does great with the children's yoga. And we've got just different, different people that we've pulled in that are, that are really good at what they do for STEM. We got the licensing for to use a curriculum that is super awesome so we're using all of their their materials and it's just a great 
easy place to find those things and know that they're being taught in that your kids are really going to learn from it, that right. they're going to, that they're not going to, maybe they'll come away with more questions, but that'll be a good thing. And maybe they'll come away with wanting more and being more curious, but that's a good thing. We're not going to leave them lacking though. I love that. It's it's like, so we, I've talked before on, on this podcast about strewing, you know, get, mm-hmm. getting, laying things out for your kids to discover and like see where it goes. And so this is kind of another way to strew really, because yeah. you're, str- instead of strewing like materials, and I've talked about strewing like websites by putting things up on on the screen or documentaries, queuing things up on Curiosity Stream or other places like yes. that. You could do something like that, you know, pull one of these activities and then see where it leads them. So that's super fun. Hey there. Okay, so you've heard me talk about CTC Math for months and months, and it is because we just love it here. It has made my homeschooling easier, especially when it comes to math. I'm not a mathy person, and I never have been, but I love CTC because it makes it easy for me, and then when my kids struggle with a certain concept or they're not getting something quickly enough, I can watch the lesson too, and then I can get it. So it's teaching me, really, truly, almost as much as it's teaching the kids, because if I don't get something, I can watch the tutorials. And that exact experience happened to a longtime follower, Sandy, who wrote in, we started using CTC Math following your recommendation, Colleen. One of my sons is so dedicated. Then, after watching over his shoulder, my other son started using it too. They both do an hour each weekday, their choice. Now, side note here, CTC Math only takes about seven to 10 minutes per lesson. My kids tend to do one to two, sometimes very occasionally three lessons a day. So we're talking like anywhere between 15 and 40 minutes of math a day, max. But Sandy's kids are so into it that they are doing an hour a day, their choice. Okay, so Sandy says, I even enjoy it myself. I do the lessons with them, which is a handy brush up and will occasionally do some of the algebra lessons ahead of time. Math was not my strong suit in school, but now I love it and I wish the program had been available in the 80s. Too many people think they're terrible at math, but I truly believe we all need a method of learning that suits us. CTC math seems to work for all three of us. I asked my 13-year-old son, who's been using the program for about 18 months, what he thinks of it, and in his own words, he said he enjoys reaching mastery in a particular subject because I know that if I get a question wrong, he says, I'll have to redo all the questions until I reach mastery. That means I will have a full grasp of the subject, and that's pretty satisfying. 13-year-old, come on, like you can't beat that. Okay. FYI, Sandy says, I have the pass rate set to 90%. So parents, you can set the rate you want your kids to meet. My my settings, depending on the kid, are set between 85 and 95%. I've got one kid who is a full year ahead in math and he's really good at math and his is set to 95%. I've got another one who's a little iffy at math and that kiddo's level is set to 85%. So you get to do what you want to do in it And that's amazing. Okay. She goes on to say and finishes off this quote by saying, CTC math is unlike any platform that's out there. And I just love it. I appreciate you, Colleen. You have a special place in my heart for everything you put into your work. And I appreciate you and all the things you share. Seriously, I'm going to keep sharing resources like CTC math because they work. They make homeschooling easier and they allow us to do the things that we want to do with our kids and basically take off of our plates the things we have to do with our kids. Our kids need math. Let CTC do it. Check them out at ctcmath.com. Let them know I sent you. And then if you've got a story to share, I'd love to hear it. All right, let's get back to today's episode. You had mentioned to me, but we haven't mentioned it on here, But so I want to make sure I do, that um, if you're interested in, if you're listening and you're interested in just kind of seeing how this all works, you could go to sparkschooling.com slash samples, and there are some sample lessons there, so you can kind of check them out and see if it would be a good fit for your kids. So you can, you know, maybe in, incorporate some of these things in your in mm-hmm. your schooling. 
I want to talk a little bit more about something that you mentioned earlier, because I think it goes into why these subjects are so important. You'd mentioned when we were kind of chatting about sparking that curiosity about connections and how things like this, these kinds of activities can link the right brain and left brain. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Like, why is that even important? What does that have to do with anything? What, for those who maybe are listening and don't know anything about the differences between right brain and left brain learning, how does that fit in and why would that make an impact on our kids and their learning and their well-roundedness? Yeah, great question. So when we're talking left brain and right brain, that's the more analytical side of the brain versus the more creative side of the brain. And when we are thinking about learning and education, anytime we can link those two together, that is going to give our kids such a more meaningful educational experience in that area. So there's a taxonomy of learning, the Bloom's taxonomy, where the lower levels are just very basic learning facts and understanding and just the basics of a of a subject area. That's the like the knowledge, the basic knowledge. But as you move up that taxonomy, we're getting into things like analyzing and evaluating and creating. And when we when we move up into those types of things and you're creating something new or you are analyzing, just, you know, even like listening to to music and being like, oh, it's it's soft here. And oh, now it's loud. And so I'm analyzing. That's that's analyzing. Right. We are linking those the analytical side and the creative side. You're starting to do that. And your kids are going to understand on a deeper level the concepts that they're that they're learning and learn how to not just know things, but to be able to apply them to new situations and be able to integrate what they're learning in this area to something completely different in another area. It's that creative problem solving that happens when they when they start to have these types of of learning that happen. Now, I think that this is really natural for kids. I, I think that it just happens. And when you go and create the, you know, Bloom when he created the Bloom's taxonomy, like like he just needed to look at a little kid for a minute just to see how that all all goes into place. But I love that we can we can see that in our kids and as homeschoolers we have the opportunity to to go beyond just facts and figures and basic level understanding where we can ask them and have them, you know, apply it in in a hands-on way, right? To show what they have learned in and by like even things like retelling and story, like telling a story with it or making up a puppet show with it, you know, just like where they're taking their learning and taking those facts and things and doing something creative with it to really deepen their understanding. It'll help it be more memorable for them and it will help their curiosity lead them to more learning, which is exactly what we want. Once our kids are lifelong learners, then we're done. Our job. Here is right. done because they're never going to stop wanting to learn more. So I think that's the I think that's the key to to really getting your kids to to love learning is give them ways to apply it, different creative ways to apply it and create something meaningful. Yeah, and like you mentioned, with bringing Bloom's taxonomy into it, right the the majority of our textbook learning or workbook mm-hmm. learning is is focused on the bottom because they're easy questions and answers. They're easy to check mm-hmm. according to, you know, an answer key because when you're talking about, you know, knowledge based questions, there's a right and a wrong. And while we need to know that our kids understand concepts, yes. that's just the beginning because right. We can understand all the math facts, say, you know, we want to understand, but until we can apply those to problems that are posed of us, or we can understand that, you know, such and such happened in history around this time, but until we can synthesize it and see that like, oh, that's kind of repeating itself. It's something that has already happened before. And then think critically about it. We're not going to be as well-rounded, as you mentioned earlier, or as as curious and innovative in our thinking and our learning. And it's 
It's and so by starting those kinds of making those kinds of connections and focusing on those higher level thinking skills early, we set our kids up for more success in all the different areas that they're going to go into, whether they're making a decision about where they want to live or where they want to go to college or what Mm -hmm. career they want to get into, or they're on their own and they're trying to figure out how to solve the problem of, well, gosh, my car broke down and I still need to put groceries on the table this month. So where can I what, how can I use what I already have in a way that's going to get me through until I can get this repair done or whatever? Mm-hmm. It all links together and they're not waiting for someone to just tell them the right answer because they've gotten the practice in taking the knowledge and the things that they're the facts and the things that they're learning and applying them to something that's a deeper level. Yeah. And starting with things that are fun and super engaging for them you know, to apply their math concepts to a fun building project that, you know, that's something, a fun way to start the process just by making it fun and making it and making it easy. And they're learning to start thinking critically and use those problem solving skills, those critical thinking skills. And like you said, that will serve them for the rest of their lives. Uh, I know it's kind of like a joke, you know, like, oh, I, you know, I'm so glad I learned about Pythagorean's theorem in school, but I don't know how to do, you know, all of these basic life skills. Well, you learn the, the critical thinking skills in behind those things. And that is those critical thinking skills is what is going to teach or is going to allow your kids to, you know, fill in the blanks with anything that they, that they come across in in their life. Although, you know, there are definite life skills that they need to learn and we can do all of that as homeschoolers, but it's that setting them up for figuring it out when we, when it's something, you know, I know homeschoolers are so often, myself included, worried about gaps, right? Did I did I skip something really critical? But if you teach them to think and give them that that basic knowledge and understanding with those facts, but you teach them how to think critically, they'll figure it out. Yeah. And they'll they'll know that they can, that they don't mm-hmm. have to wait for someone to tell them or teach them. Yes. They can figure it out. My kids were my younger two, which who are not like young anymore. I was just having this conversation <laughs> with someone. I keep calling them the littles and yeah. you know my little ones, but they're 14 and 11. So that's not really little anymore. But oh. anyway, they're my littles. They were in, in their class yesterday and they take this, this homeschooling with horses class is what it's called, mm-hmm. but it's not like just horseback riding or, or horse grooming or whatever. They do all sorts of different things depending on the weather and what's going on in the stables at that time of year. And yesterday it was nice for the first time it was cold but it was mm-hmm. nice and sunny so they were riding and they were riding these the rescue horses so they're very placid and very calm they were riding them bareback just kind of hopping on cool. using the, the block and mm-hmm. feeling you know what it felt like to have the horse and the muscles you know beneath them but they ended up playing with inertia and were telling me like you know forces in motion and dropping some an object from a moving thing how you how you had to adjust they were given eggs from the coop and a target that as they were walking around with the horse in the paddock they had to drop the egg in a certain way and were realizing and recognizing that when they dropped it the horse was still moving so the egg actually didn't drop where they needed it to drop so then they had to readjust on the second and third pass through so they could so hit the cool. target yeah and it's totally not what you would you would think to you know as as a as a typical learner slash teacher, you would think, okay, well, if I'm going to be teaching inertia, I've got to be like reading this section in the textbook or, you know, watch this, you know, video about how inertia works, but they're going to remember a force, how forces act upon each other in a, in a very real way and be able to extrapolate that the next time they come into a problem that is related to motion and moving objects versus a stationary object and, you know, whatever. But it was, it was interesting hearing them talk about it when they got, you know, home. And, and I think about all the time, they, our job isn't to give them all the, of the facts and figures. Our job is to help them see themselves as learners in every situation they're in and to give them the confidence to pull whatever it is they can from a given situation and mm-hmm. apply it in the future, knowing that, they can ask questions. They don't have to know everything. And 
the goal in life isn't to know everything. Mm -hmm. It is to be able to find out the answers to anything they're interested in learning about. Right. Oh, I love that. And I'm like going to go set something up for my kids <laughs> in the cul-de-sac with their bikes right. and, and tennis balls. We're going to do that. It's going to be fun. fun. That is so fun. I love that. We don't yeah, have horses, so, but we well, got bikes. Yeah, I, I don't either. I had to <laughs> you know, sign them up for something, Yeah, but, but I would have never thought to do that. <gasps> and it's just like, what a perfect way to give them an exposure. Like you said earlier, you know, they may not be studying inertia this year, or maybe they mm -hmm. studied it last year or whatever, but they're going to remember that the next time they come across it in exactly. their, in any kind of study or book or whatever. And so that's what we want to do. And that's like, I, I think I'm true in saying the, the idea behind this spark schooling kind of movement, really, if we want to just mm -hmm. call it that mm -hmm. finding those sparks and helping them build on those and be more curious and more interested. And then as a result, interesting, right? Yes. Yeah. Having such a varied and ver of different things that they can do or that they can talk about or that they can, you know, just later on develop more of an interest in, you know, maybe we just did art, you know, just for fun, you know, while we were homeschooling, but later on, you know, they might really get into oil pastels or watercolors, right. you know, so having just that foundation is going to be so, so good for them when, when they become adults. I love it. Okay. So before we go, one more question, is there like, what would you say we've, t we've given a lot of advice in this episode, but like you're, you're faced with a new homeschool mom, who's really nervous about getting all the things in and, and fitting things in and feeling like she's going to fail her kids in some way or another, what would be your like off the cuff, best piece of advice for that new homeschool mom or even a veteran homeschool mom who feels like those gaps are, are, are there? What would be that, that one piece of advice you'd want them to take away from this episode, or you didn't get a chance to say that you think is the most important to help them keep going? I think relax, <laughs> take a deep breath and know that you are the best teacher for your kids you just the fact that you care about possibly having those gaps means that you are doing a really good job. So I would I would say just, you know, follow their natural curiosities and allow those to lead. And if you have like what you were talking about at the beginning, you know, days where you are just doing the the core classes, you're just doing math and and a little bit of reading and writing and that's all you can do that day that's great. And if you have other days where all you want to do is art and music or whatever, then that's great. It, it all comes together. It Your kids learn what they're ready to learn and what they need to learn to get to the next level. So go at the, you know, just follow those interests, follow those natural curiosities as much as you can and make it as simple as possible for yourself. Make it easy. Your kids don't need anything super, super extravagant in all the things, right? They can just, they they will learn so much even with simple, making it so simple. They will learn They and they can learn and they will learn so, so much. Perfect. Okay. So where can everyone find you, Rachel? The best place is sparkschooling.com that you'll find everything you need there and it will link to all the other places. It'll link to all the socials, all of the, the free sample classes, like you mentioned before, and just an overview of everything that we offer. So go to sparkschooling.com and, and that'll get you, that'll get you where you need to go. Well, thank you so much for being here. I'm so glad we got a chance to do this finally. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. This has been fun. All right. So we'll be back next week, same time, same place with another episode. In the meantime, I would encourage you, you can pop over to the show notes for this episode and find links to all the different things that Rachel and I talked about, including some of the books we mentioned. But this week, I really want to encourage you to find something to light that spark in your kiddo. Just enjoy them. Get out, enjoy some fresh air, go for a walk, uh, kick the soccer ball around in the backyard, try a new art project together. Do something that's going to light a little spark of curiosity in your kids and possibly even you let them see you following that curiosity enjoy them enjoy your kids enjoy this process and i will talk to you soon bye for now